Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy and I want to welcome you to this online service. In a short moment, we're going to have a time of worship and afterwards, Jack will lead us into a sermon union from the life of Abraham facing the facts with faith. I hope you enjoy today. Just want to bring you this quick lesson from the life of Abraham titled Face the Facts with Faith. Uh, it's going to be part of a series looking at different characters of faith and this being the first one looking at the life of Abraham. I've got three very brief points for us which is that faith obeys, faith embraces the promises and faith faces the facts. A little bit of a tongue twister but got through it. Let's look at three key moments from the life of Abraham, consider some points and applications for us, and then end looking at some of the promises in the Bible that God has given us. So let's start here in Genesis 12, one to four, the calling of Abraham. In verse one, it says, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. 
and they arrive there. So this is the calling of Abraham. God says to him, go from your country, your people, your father's household to this new land that I'm going to show you, a land that Abraham was not familiar with. And he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. Your name is going to be great. He gives them all these incredible promises. This scripture combined with a few others, we know that there are a couple of different layers to the promise given to Abraham. Uh, it was promise of a descendant. And, and descendants. So he, promise, he was promised an heir, he was promised a family, ultimately this great nation and peoples, uh, many peoples coming from him. We see elsewhere, we, he's promised that kings will come from his line and all, all kinds of things. He's promised also a land, so as well as a people, he's promised a land, uh, a place that they would be their home and that they would own. And then thirdly, there's a, there's a spiritual component to the blessing as well. In fact, in a moment, when we look at um, Genesis 15, it talks about look at the stars of the sky. It talks about the, so your descendants will be. But he also says all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So somehow through Abraham, um, the entire world was going to be blessed. So these were the layers of the promises that, that, that God gave to Abraham. What does Abraham do? Quite simply, he obeys. In Hebrews 11, verse 8, if you want to read that. Uh, when called to a, go to a land he didn't know, it says he obeyed and went. The first point, quite simply, is that faith obeys. Faith is the righteous response from humans to, to the calling of God. When God says go, we go. When God says do this, we do it. When God says don't do that, we don't do it. And this is the challenge for us. Often we can intellectualize or spiritualize our disobedience or there's a reason i'm not quite obeying right now or sometimes our own emotions get in the way well how i feel or i'm up and down in different things all of these things are real and genuine and often we can have very serious things going on in our life but nothing ever justifies our disobedience to god we always called to obey we're always called to do what is right we're always called to do exactly what he tells us to do that is the calling so number one, faith obeys. The second point, let's have a look here in Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and, it, and he credited it to him as righteousness. See, one of the things that's very real and going on here is that Abraham's starting to wrestle with this promise that God has given him. And now he's saying, well, but look, no one's here. I don't have an heir. It's, it's going to be this um, Eliezer of Damascus. He's going to inherit my estate. I, I have no physical blood descendants. So he's going back to this promise that God has made him. And he's like, what's going on here? Why isn't this working out exactly the way we'd hoped in a way you'd said, God? But God reaffirms to him this promise. He reminds him what he's what he's promised him, uh, but he reassures him and he calls him not to be afraid. The amazing thing about this in verse six, it says Abram believed the Lord and he credited it, credited it to him as righteousness. I've got a few tongue twisters in this. The second point is faith embraces the promises. Now, I think what's worth noting in Abraham's life is that Abraham did not do this perfectly by any means. We see several failures throughout Abraham's life. He lies twice about his wife saying instead that she's his sister and really out of fear that he's going to be harmed. Um, even him and Sarah kind of hatch up this plot between ha um, his, the, his maidservant and he has another he has Ishmael through her and it causes all kinds of mess and dysfunction. Uh, they're trying to take things into their own hands at different points. We see uh, not a perfect faithful trajectory. We see wobbles. We see stumbles. We see um, challenges in Abraham's life. But what we do see is the general trajectory of his life is one of faith. It's one of trust. It's one of belief in God. It's one where he embraces the promises of God and puts his life fully into the Lord's hands in every way that he can. And the second point for us is this. Faith embraces the promises. 
we'll look towards the end of this video at some promises that God has given us in scripture. And it's a challenge for us. It's, it's encouraging and reassuring for us, but also a challenge for us to cling on to those promises and, and trust, especially when things don't go the way we think they should be going or work out exactly the way we think they should be working out. Final point here, we'll read in Romans 4, 18 to 21, and where we've got the title of this lesson from. In verse 18, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. What did I say that the title of this lesson was? I said it was face the facts with faith coming from this scripture here in Romans 4, 19. There's a there's a wonderful tension going on here. So number one in verse 19, it says without weakening in his faith, he also he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And again, 25 or more years now since he had made the promise back when he was around 75. So a long time has gone on since God has made this promise. You think of you think of a chunk of time like that, several decades. A lot of us haven't even be, quite been alive that long. I barely passed three decades. Most of my life waiting for the promise of God. That's a challenge. But what day, what Abraham did, he didn't weaken in his faith. He says in verse 20, he did not waver for unbelief regarding this promise. No, he was strengthened in his faith. He gave glory to God. He was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. So another tension here. Abraham, on one hand, knew God has promised this. And on another hand, God can do this. So he, those two things together strengthened his faith. God, you said you would do this. I know you're powerful enough to do this. There's, there's no reason there that this won't follow through. So even though time had gone on, even though there were challenges in between, he didn't weaken in his faith. But he also faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And I love this principle because faith isn't naive, ignoring the facts, pretending they don't exist, nor does faith give in to the reality of physical circumstances, forgetting who God as the creator is and forgetting what he has promised. Faith lives in that beautiful middle ground where we understand the reality around us. We don't pretend it's not there. We're not naive or ignorant to it, but we face those facts with faith, knowing our God is bigger and stronger and can overcome those things and holding on to the promises that he has given us. So point one, faith obeys. Point two, faith embraces the promises. And point three, faith faces the facts. May we be encouraged and inspired by Abraham's example. And may we too hold on to the promises of God. So here's what I want to do to end this lesson for us is I want to remind us of some of the promises that we see in scripture. And, and as you see here in Genesis 21, I won't read this whole scripture, but it, um, God was gracious to Sarah, as he had said in verse one, the Lord and did for the, Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time that God had promised him. And God gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. So we see here God came through on this promise. Maybe not on Abraham and Sarah's timeline. I'm sure they wanted it to happen quicker, but God came through. God had promised. So let's embrace some of these promises right now. I want to read for you Hebrews 6. And what I want to go through quite quickly is I want to go through 10 promises that we see in Scripture that I hope can really encourage you today. But I want us to understand this principle because I think it's a really important one. So as we set the scene, let's read here in Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 13. Now, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, 
He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which is it, Im- it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, I am going to avoid the temptation to dive into some good deep teaching on the priesthood of Melchizedek and the inner sanctuary and all these other things. They are wonderful, wonderful Bible studies for you to do. And I'd I'd encourage you to do those. Um, But in short, I think the one simple thing I want us to really focus on here is just is just a simple idea that God makes us promises. You think about someone you're close to, maybe someone you love and deeply trust. When they make you a promise, hopefully you you really believe them, maybe because they're a trustworthy person, maybe because they've come through on promises before, maybe because just you know how much they love you. There's something when someone makes you a promise, there's, there's something that promise is anchored to. With someone you don't trust when they make a promise, it doesn't really mean much. Their word is kind of meaningless. One of the amazing things God does is God makes us promises. And again, God doesn't need to do this. God, God could just tell us what to do and help, make us, help us to obey and all kinds of other things. The fact that he makes us promises is to insure, assure us and to encourage us. It says that in verse 18 that we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. These, this hope, it says, is like an anchor for the soul. It's similar to what Abraham does. See, what we can do is we can face the facts of our life, some facts that maybe seem insurmountable right now. But we can also hold on to promises that God has given us in Scripture. And we can be reminded and we say, God, you promise this and you cannot lie. God, it is impossible for you to lie. So if you said you'll do this and I know you're powerful enough to do it, then I know you will come through. This is how our, our faith can be built on a really solid foundation. What's really important is that we understand the difference between a promise of God from scripture and a a desire of ours or an ask or a wish. Sometimes God says no to our prayers and it's always for our good. But God makes us promises that we can hold on to and know he will fulfill and he will follow through on. And what I want us to look at now is I want to look at 10 of those promises quite quickly for us. And I want you to think which of these stand out to you most or speak to your heart or resonate for you. I'll also include these in in the notes um, from this lesson uh, so that you can read them and reflect on them and and pick a few to hold on to as well. So let's have a look at those now. Number one, God promises us eternal life. Easy to gloss over. Yeah, yeah, we know that. But what an amazing thing that is for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. that Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And this is what he has promised us. Eternal life. Let's hold on to that promise and remember that we're not made for this world. There is a a life beyond this one. This this tiny little life we're living right now is a blip in the grand scheme of things. And what we're really waiting for is eternity with God in heaven and how amazing that is going to be. But let's hold on to that promise and that will remind us uh, what life we're really living down here, a temporary one. God promises the forgiveness of sins. See, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness, unrighteousness. Uh, A condition here, we're talking about we need to confess. Uh, We need to keep walking in the light, one one John also says. Uh, We need to keep coming to him and seeking him. But he is a gracious God. He will forgive us. It says also there's a compassions anew every morning. We will be purified. What an amazing promise when you know I've done wrong. I'm not where I need to be. I've I've got there's some ickiness. I need to come to God. I will be forgiven. He promises that he will not condemn you and hold it over you. He's promised us forgiveness. God promises his presence, a wonderful promise of an amazing father. It says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And in Hebrews 13, it says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. One of the promises that is such a blessing, a blessing much greater than so many others, knowing 
that we have the presence of God with us, knowing that our heavenly father is always with us, never forsaking us, never leaving us, but promising us that he is with us. Here in Philippians 4, again, think of the conditions here, right? It's important for us to understand how I engage with God in some of these things. But it says, do not be anxious about anything. So I can be anxious, I could give in to anxiety, or in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So if I give in to my anxiety, if I get fixated on all the issues and all the problems and get overwhelmed with it and just focus on that and never pray, will I have the peace that transcends all understanding? No. But if I make a conscious choice in those moments when I'm feeling anxious, I'm afraid, I'm insecure, whatever it may be, and I decide, you know what, I'm going to come to God, I'm going to pray. Or elsewhere where it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. By prayer, by petition, asking God for things, presenting my requests, also with thanksgiving, then I'm promised here that the peace of God will come. That will transcend all understanding and it will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus a wonderful prayer and some clear practical ways that we can engage with God uh, when we're feeling like this. God promises us provision. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And Philippians 4, 19, it says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God is able to meet all our needs above and beyond in great abundance. But again, what are we called to do? We call to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. When you read, read Matthew 6 in context, it talks a lot about how they're worried about this and worried about that. And where are they going to get things? What, food and clothing and everything else. He says, don't worry. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God promises us his strength. He says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not grow grow weary they will walk and not be faint i can do all this through him who gives me strength we are promised strength to endure every situation every trial whatever life may throw at us we can endure we can overcome we can flourish and thrive in fact when we put our hope in god god promises us guidance it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding, own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. With God's loving eye, like a, a gentle, loving father, he guides us. He teaches us. He makes our paths straight when we seek him, when we choose to put our hope and trust in him. Not leaning our own understanding, wanting to do life our way, taking everything into our own hands. No, handing over to him. And trusting him says he will guide us in this way. Last few here in James 1 5, he promises wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You can have wisdom far beyond your years and deep and great understanding because you have a heavenly father, the creator of the universe, to talk to. Ask him for wisdom, he will give it. Lastly, last couple here, God promises us victory. He says, But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then lastly, God promises us unfailing love. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You are secure. You are safe. You are on solid ground in the unfailing love of God. No one can take that from you. There is nothing to, that can come between you and God unless you let it, unless you choose to put other things before God. But no other power or nothing from outside can get in between. God is not going to abandon you, leave you, forsake you, let go of you. God is is always perfect in this relationship and is dynamic with us he has complete and unfailing love all we need to do is choose to continue to embrace that love and continue to come to him i have a last um, couple of reflection questions just for you to think about as you think about some of these thoughts from this lesson face the facts with faith faith obeys it embraces the promises and faith faces the facts 
What about us? What promises can we hold on to and can we embrace? Number one, what facts in your life right now seem insurmountable? What are the Goliaths, the big giant walls of Jericho, whatever else it may be, that just feels like an insurmountable thing to you right now? Number two, let's be honest. What is an area of your life where you haven't been fully obeying God? Or perhaps not obeying at all? Or just maybe that area you've just pushed away somewhere and hidden and you're trying not to think about. What, what's that area where you know you need to bring this out into the light and fully obey and fully trust God with? And then lastly, what promises of God can you embrace today? Sorry for the typo. But what promises of God can you embrace? Maybe it's one of these 10. There are many others in scripture as well. But think of some promises in scripture that you can hold on to, that you can cling to, that you can choose to trust God with. I hope this has been a helpful blessing to you. Face the facts with faith. Have a wonderful day. See you all soon. Lastly, as we consider the communion, uh, what it means for us every week to remember the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. I just want to circle back to the scripture we just read, that final blessing, that final promise here in Romans chapter eight, which reads again. I'll, I'll read it again in verse 38. It says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. One of the incredible things that Jesus has done through the cross, um, what, what God has done in, in binding us to himself and giving us these very great and precious promises is he's given us complete and utter reassurance one of the things I always go back to when I think of the cross is realizing that my salvation, the forgiveness of sins God has offered me, the freedom I have, the relationship I have with him is not based on my good works, my effort, my merit or any other of those things that in me, very honestly, wavers and varies from day to day, often from hour to hour sometimes. All of those things rest upon God's unfailing love, rests upon who he is in his perfect and unchanging nature. So nothing can separate me from God. One, because he's not going to change. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't randomly reject us. He doesn't wake up and have a bad day. Um, he doesn't get kind of so irritated with us that he just quits and gives up on us. That's not who God is. That's often who we are, but that's not how God treats us. And and there isn't these the standard that I can fall from that I am now cast out and rejected. No, God is so perfect, so consistent and so loving that it really always goes back to what he's done for us on the cross, which is why we can, we also can be convinced that nothing, even death itself, Remembering that promise of eternal life, even death itself, no other powers that exist in this world can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So as we take communion now, remembering this together, and we take the bread and we take the wine, we can remember this incredible assurance that we have based on the promises of God, but based on his character, his unchanging nature, and the incredible work he has done through Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you. God, we love you. Uh, we are so grateful for what you have done in our lives. We are so grateful for the fact that you are such a good and patient and loving God. And you are a God who reaches out to us and makes yourself known to us. You reveal yourself to us and you offer us these incredible promises that we can really hang our hopes on and our faith on. We are so grateful for that. We're grateful for what you've done uh, through Jesus, through the sacrifice on the cross, um, shedding your blood lowering yourself to take on flesh in the first place, but even then to um, pour out your humanity, pour out your very life so that we can be freed and so that we can know you truly, that you demonstrated your love in this way and that through that sacrifice, we can be free. We can be drawn close to you. God, we thank you so much. Thank you for the, the bread and the wine, these things we, that we take every week as remembrance, remembering this incredible thing you've done for us and remembering who you are. 
God, we love you. We thank you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everyone. Bye for now.
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven to do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the wind may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak your word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, sing my praise your name great is your faithfulness to me oh, seasons change you remain the same
to you.